Hello everyone, my name is Rachel Moses and you are listening to the AHP Leader podcast. And this podcast series is starting individual conversations almost like an interview style with really important people and really special people. So I am delighted to be hosting this conversation piece with Rachel. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about why I'm interviewing Rachel, why we're having this conversation. And I'd just first like to start off by asking you to introduce yourself. Hello. So my name's Rachel and I am a Band 5 physio at Harefield Hospital. I started working there um, with Rachel in July this year after I qualified, um, obviously, as a physio from the University of Nottingham. So... As Rachel mentioned, we work together and we spell our names the same way, which is <laughs> Um, But the reason why um, I am interviewing Rachel is because she has had an incredible journey to become a physiotherapist. And her journey has actually went from patient to physiotherapist. And before Rachel came to our organisation, I remember a tweet And um, I didn't work in the organisation at the time. I was going to be a newbie and around the same time Rachel was joining. So, um, you know, I've reached out and said, let's learn a little bit more from you because what an incredible journey you've had. So do you want to start by taking us back to the beginning? So you had an illness um, that, you know, became severe enough. You ended up in hospital and on critical care. So do you want to start by you know, in as much or as little detail as you like talking with through that patient journey. Yeah, so it was actually around this time, about six years ago, where it all started. So I was 19 years old and I'd just gone to university in Liverpool to study um, psychology and criminology. And I was having an amazing time and I um, suddenly became quite unwell with um, flu symptoms and so it was all just assumed that I had fresh as flu. Um, I'd been going out and getting up to no good so it was it it had been anticipated that at some point I was going to come become unwell Um, and I recovered from that and I was absolutely fine. Um, Came home for my reading week which my home is Nottingham And it was a Saturday night and I remember being with my friends, many of them that I'd not seen for a number of weeks and my hands and feet had started to tingle. And I'd said to them, oh, this is a little bit weird. And they were like, oh, you're probably just feeling a little bit anxious. And I was like, yeah, you're probably right. As the night progressed, I found that um, my legs were starting to get heavier and uh, my back was getting really sore. And so I left the night earlier than my friends, which was still pretty late. Um, and went home. Uh, On the Sunday, I woke up and I thought I had a really, really bad hangover. I couldn't sit up. I was feeling really, really sick. Um, Couldn't even eat my roast dinner, which was one of the main things that I'd gone home on my reading week for. Um, And by about 8, 9 p.m. that evening, my um, feet had, I was dragging them across the floor to get upstairs. And now I didn't really think much of it at that point either because I'd been wearing these chunky pair of heels and figured worse comes to worse, I've probably danced too much, I've, I've trapped a nerve. Um, my you know, understanding of the human body and anatomy at that point was pretty much nil. And so I just thought that it would be something really, really simple. I'd wake up the next day and I'd feel fine. So I woke up on the Monday morning and um, I just couldn't move my legs. Uh, still at that point, not phased, <laughs> wasn't really, you know, too fussed by it. Army crawled to the toilet, fell off the toilet and then thought, right, I should probably ring my mum or someone and tell them that this is going on. Um, rang my mum and she was like, Rachel, you know, if you were at university, which is where I would have been, you know, a week before or a week later, she was like, you'd, you'd have to sort this out yourself. I'm very busy today. Crack on. Um And it was from there that I was taken to the hospital and quite quickly diagnosed with um, Guillain-Barre syndrome. Um, So that was on the Monday. Uh, I remember that they started me on uh, intravenous immunoglobulins, which is the pretty standard um, treatment for anyone with GBS. Um, I was on the neuro ward and I remember Googling what GBS was and still not being particularly phased, um, sending my mum the Wikipedia page, at which point she was like, ah, 
I'm so sorry that I made you sort this out yourself. Um, and uh, from there, it kind of kind of went downhill. <laughs> um, by the Thursday, my breathing had become quite shallow. And that's when they took me to the ITU. Um, on the Sunday, I ended up having a grand mal seizure. And that's when I was intubated. And what had happened there is that I'd had a reaction to the um, intravenous immunoglobulins. Um, so they weren't actually sure if it was GBS or not, but then realized that um, I'd actually just had uh, PRES. I think that's posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome. Um, so after a couple of days of being intubated and sedated, they withdrew the sedation and extubated me. I then had another seizure and that's when they put my trachea in. Um, at this point, the paralysis had progressed to the point where it was head to toe. I'd uh, lost my swallow the previous week. Um, I think that was on the Thursday or the Friday when I'd first been taken to the ITU. Um, and yeah, it went from there. So I, at my very, very worst with the GBS, I couldn't actually blink or close my eyes. So I was having to have my eyes taped shut. Um, which wasn't, you know, in terms of communication, that was probably the hardest thing. And I'm quite chatty. And so not having a voice was really, really difficult. Um, but luckily, I was sent to a different hospital within Nottinghamshire. Um, and that's when they started me on the uh, plasma phoresis. And from there, I started to make small but slow improvements. And so the thing that came back first was my facial movements and shoulder movements, which made communication still really difficult, but a lot easier. Um, I was communicating using a letter board where I'd look at letters and I'd either um, blink or try and move my shoulders to uh, spell out words. Often the only words that I was spelling out was swear words. <laughs> so I wasn't particularly pleasant to be around. Um, but that was also because I was in a huge amount of pain, um, which can happen if you have got GBS. Um, so once I started to recover, I ended up being in the ITU uh, with a trachea for, I think it was around eight or nine weeks. Um, so I was then um, decannulated, which I remember being a very terrifying experience. I was, con uh, I was convinced that I would not be able to breathe by myself um, and that was horrific on its own and then I was sent to a rehab unit where I was a complete nightmare for the first two three weeks um, and then slowly but surely managed to um, gain my muscle back gain gain everything back and managed to leave walking um, my physios who were fantastic everyone that looked after me was amazing but I remember when I first went to the ITU being introduced to physios in the ITU. And for me, I had never thought that you'd find, I didn't even know physios were in an inpatient setting. I always thought that these were the people who would go and help footballers or like, which isn't my kind of physio. Like I'm not a, necessarily a sporty person. I'm not that way inclined. And I remember they'd come and do all of this chest physio on me. And for me, that was the most horrific experience. I hated every second of it. Um, but obviously I had a trachea. I had you know, a neuromuscular disorder. I couldn't cough for myself and I was being suctioned and having all of these manual techniques. But that's what start that's what piqued my interest into physio because I was like wow this is actually kind of cool even though I hated every second um I was like actually this is this is kind of interesting um one of the biggest things when I was a patient is I was desperate to be in control and I'd gone from a point where I'd just moved out just gone to university I had the most independence of my entire life to then effectively having the the skills and of a newborn baby, I was having my, you know, I was being cleaned by other people. I couldn't speak. Um, and so for me, any way that I could get control was something that I was desperate to, to have. Um, and the physios realized this because oftentimes they'd say they were gonna do something and I'd just point blank refuse. Um, 
and they realized that if they started to teach me about the things that they were going to do so that I understood why they needed to do it then I was much more likely to be compliant and let them do that do whatever they needed to do um and then obviously when I went into the rehab unit that's when I had uh, my new, my more um hands-on um intensive physio that got me back to how I am now effectively but um like I said when I first went to the rehab unit I was a complete nightmare um and I remember one of my physios after I'd thrown a tantrum said I'm not going to do it she came and sat with me and she was like if you want to if you want to leave then you need to start putting in effort we can't do physio for you you have to do it yourself and that just completely changed my mindset and whilst I was there I also got to see how the other residents at the rehab facility were doing because of their physio and that was so inspiring um you know I made friends with a lady with MS and watching her go through her physio and every day every week make this progress um was just so cool and so when I was discharged I um decided initially that I was going to go back to Liverpool to recommence my studies and try again and I was in, I was, went back to Liverpool for six weeks, which had been the same amount of time as the year previous. And I had a very minor relapse, at which point I was like, clearly there is a, a black cloud over Liverpool. I'm not supposed to be there. Um, and that's when I thought, do you know what would be really, really cool is if I became a physio, because these people completely changed my life. And I would love to be able to do that for someone else. Oh, wow. I mean, there's so many things I want to pick up. Uh, that's such an inspirational story. Um, and, do you know, some of the podcasts I've been doing, especially um, some of the most recent ones, when you hear of some of the more like lesser known allied health professionals, um, they always generally tend to have, have had an encounter or an experience of that profession, yeah. which sparks the interest. Um, and then it's the misconceptions. Oh, I thought the OT only done this or the physio only done this. And it's not until the then information gather about more things that they realize that the profession is so diverse. So I want to take you back to that ITU. I have looked after many, many people with Gill and Barry over the years. Um, you know, I worked in a neurotrauma intensive care unit for a long time and, and then in home ventilation and and barry is a devastating disease um it's a syndrome and it as you said can quite rapidly come on i mean you're from your presentation on the friday to being intubated and ventilated over two or three days you know that that is a that is a rapid progression and for some people they wean off mechanical ventilation normally wean off mechanical ventilation normally the airway is spared so with a little bit of rehab people can talk again and eat again and, and swallow again um, but sometimes the muscles, you know, the respiratory muscles, the diaphragm never fully recovers and they might need cough assist therapy forever or non-invasive ventilation forever. So, um, so the fact that you had such a severe form of GBS um, as well and came out the other end is amazing. It's brilliant. Probably a testament to your hard work and your age and being fit and healthy and everything else. I want to take you back to that time you were in critical care and you did have a trachea in and you were completely paralyzed. And that for me, having looked after people is like my worst nightmare. I mean, I think it's not even being able to itch your nose. It's not even being able to ask for a drink when you're thirsty. It's about people having to second guess why your heart rates went up, why there's a tear that's come out of your eye because you can't express or communicate any type of emotion, whether it be happiness, sad, you lose your facial muscles, you can't even smile. Um, so when someone walks in the door and all you want to do is give them a hug or thank them for being there, you can't do that. Like, what, what is that? How does that feel? Like, can you, can, have you blocked it out of your mind? Uh, I've not really blocked it out of my mind. It's really, really strange. It's almost like I'm, I, I feel dissociated from it. Like I, 
I know it happened and I can recall it happening. I know how I felt that it feels like it was a completely different person, um, which is probably why I can speak about it so freely because I've, I've spoken to and supported numerous other people who've gone through it and they can become really, really emotional. And for me, it's almost like I'm telling a story about someone else, even though I know, I know it was me. Like I have, I have pictures and everything. Um, but I think the overriding thing that I felt was just this frustration and I was frustrated at my body for letting me down. Um, I felt so let down by my body and I felt like I was letting, you know, my family down. I, it was arguably more traumatic for them to witness it happening to me than it was for me going through it. And so I was so frustrated at that. I was frustrated at the loss of um, my university experience at that point. I was frustrated at the fact that I didn't know if my life was going to be changed forever. Um, and as well, not communicating. Um, I remember there was one um, incident where my grandma was trying to use the letter board and my mum came my mum and dad came and visited me every day and so they got really really good at using the letter board and nine times out of ten they knew exactly what I wanted and my grandma bless her came to visit me um, and she, I'd, I'd look at word and then uh, look at a letter sorry and then she'd just say a random word and so it was it was just her speaking words at me and I remember getting so like furious at her mm. even though she was trying her hardest and she gave it to my to, to my mum to do and I the, the first thing that I sort of indicated to say was shut up mama because mm. <laughs> I just I was so so frustrated mm. at everything um and I was really angry as well like I was just angry that I was there like I shouldn't have been there up until that point I was really really fit and healthy um and I knew I was missing out as well especially you know we've got social media and even though I couldn't access my social media myself because my hands weren't working um I knew that my friends were up to things that were you know way more fun than what I was doing um I spent my birthday Christmas and New Year in hospital so I knew that I was missing out on all of this experience I basically had five months of my life completely taken off of me um so yeah, it was, yeah, frustration and anger, I guess those were the, the biggest things. One thing that I did feel, but not sort of an overriding sense of it was like fear. And I think a lot of, uh, a lot of people that I've spoken to who've experienced the condition have said that they were really, really scared. But I think I was so annoyed at what was going on that I almost didn't have the brain space to be that scared about it. Um, and I was so determined that I was going to get better that mm. I didn't that there just wasn't room for me to to feel that way yeah I think there's something about having insight sometimes as well and if, when I've looked after younger people with GBS they often have this um anger that, that because they they're not life skills but their coping strategies they might have not been through a bereavement or a trauma in their life so they don't know how to deal with the emotions these new emotions they're having especially if not saying that you had a very privileged life but if you haven't ever had to go through like hardships or yeah. you know um when you have older people that go through something like this or younger people who've been through significant challenges or trauma they do respond in a different way and it doesn't mean someone's responding the right or the wrong way because it's all very individual and little things can just become massive like you said and for some like you know some of some of my patients um and you mentioned you support another Gill and Barry patients and it's amazing what the GBS Association Society I can't remember and um, the patient you know the the patient organization they are incredible because they do exactly that and as clinicians we used to phone up the association and say oh we've got a new Gill and Barry can someone come in and speak because often what they would want is just that assurance that everything was going to be okay and they would get through it and it's like you said it's just trying to externalize everything you've got internally because there's no other way you can let it out you can't go for a run you can't shout at someone you can't take it out on those most closest to you so 
in in intensive care often the patient will have their favorite ICU nurse because they know exactly how that pillow goes in behind the back they know exactly that they want a little wedge under their right buttock because that's where their pain is they'll know to lift their heels off the bed because they've got terrible neuropathic pain in their feet Um, and it's those nurses that not saying that all nurses don't do this but you know they they take the time to to make sure are you comfortable are you deaf can you move my head a tiny tiny fraction sometimes the tiny fractions the hand positions I mean these things are all so important to someone who's completely paralyzed with this terrible pain and I think as a physio working in that environment it'll be the same for your physios that used to work you know you would never leave the bed space without saying can I get you something do you want your mouth do you want your mouth washed or do you want some lip balm on or you know I was obsessed with Vaseline and lip balm um do you want us to wash wet your eyes that your eyes get so dry don't they so I think your you know your experience and then becoming a physio I can totally see how in, in a young person that that would happen in the same way I can think I never want to go near a hospital in my entire life again <laughs> you know like because and I would could, could not imagine anything worse than going into a profession you've mentioned control now control is really really important because when you're tracky ventilated with no voice and we're trying to wean people off ventilation the only control they have is that so sometimes in the psyche when you're doing when you're weaning someone when you're having short breaks off a ventilator the anxiety that in the fear can be translated into this anger and this rebelliousness so they want to control that situation and you're trying to push someone and I don't know what your weaning was like off the ventilator but often you're trying to push someone and you're, you're looking at the physiological settings and you know you they can do a little bit longer but they don't want to do a bit longer in there you know that the, it's like the head movements and the eye movements and it's so your your experience with control is absolutely something I've seen in a lot of people and it's how you then got through that so what I'm hearing when you were talking is that you became engaged with the physios and they just yeah. tried several different angles to get into you and in the end it was like look I get to go home at the night you're in here and if you don't start engaging with us you're never going to get out yeah that's exactly what it was I think I I feel really 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 strongly about uh giving my patients as much control as possible because when something goes wrong in your body you feel so out of control because often there's nothing you can do about it apart from being in the hospital and letting other people fix it for you. So I feel really, really strongly that we as clinicians should be handing over as much control to our patients as, you know, as we can reasonably. Um, And part of giving them the control is by educating them properly so that they're on the same page as us. And that's what my respiratory physios did initially. Um, They understood that I did not want to be coughed I did not want to be suctioned I did not want them percussing my chest I did not want them touching me or trying to get me into the chair but they knew that firstly I was quite bored um you know them coming in for half an hour 40 minutes a day that 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 meant that the first 10-15 minutes they could get away with telling me all about this stuff and oftentimes I would listen um And so they really, really educated me on why I needed to do it and what each piece of of equipment was. And they sort of that's how they gave the control to me so that it was almost like reverse psychology where, you know, I towards the end would quite happily let them use the cough assist I say quite happily I wasn't best for kids, <laughs> but like I, I knew they why they needed to do it I knew I was going to feel better I understood a fa- I had a foundation understanding of like the the physiological reasons for why it needed to be done and so I was much happier to let them do it and then once I got into the rehab unit it was a case of them saying we can't do this for you so either do it or sit here (laughs) yeah do you know it just rings true and I I think 
engagement and rehab is multifaceted, isn't it? And it's sometimes the more options you have, again, that's a way of giving control. So, okay, today the options are we do X, Y, Z as part of your rehab, what, what you choose. I think in a modern day critical care unit or rehab facility, there's multi-professionals, isn't there? And I think this is why I'm such a fan of the MBT because it could be the OT that com comes along and engages with you in a very different way to the physio, the exercise technician or the physio assistant slash support worker can come along and have a completely different approach and it's given people options in the rehab that's really important and yeah. you know in the old days we didn't really have much option like 15 years ago um, and it was very like you know routine like you sit over the edge of the bed or you use a tilt table and that happens three times a week and then once you've done that you can be hoisted into a chair and now there's so much around activities in ICU isn't there using balloon therapy using you know table tennis or whatever I mean I know you do that with you know but it's it's just about all these different things that we've learned over the years so for everyone that's listening there that's really good advice for physios in any arena isn't it not just about educating about giving patients control that can be true in msk and outpatients when you're prescribing therapy if you like um now before I move on to actual physiotherapy, you mentioned about the other residents and friendships you, you strike. And I think the power of other patients is really important. And I don't think we utilize that as well as physiotherapists. I think occupational therapists and psychologists do that a lot better in terms of group therapy and group engagement. But I mean, do you still keep in touch with some of the other residents? Yes, I do. Yeah, mm -hmm. I've, I've, I've still... Um, like we're friends on Facebook and stuff like that periodically check in to see how each other are now when I was in the rehab facility I was the youngest by about 20 years and um, until another slightly older lad came in but because of that I didn't actually want to engage in any of the group stuff um, wouldn't even eat in the dinner hall whenever everyone else was having dinner because I was such a, a diva um, but yeah, once I'd actually um, started, once I got over myself, basically, um, and started to form those relationships, I was just so inspired by the progress they were making. And we were almost like each other's cheerleaders. Um, and we'd, we'd go to each other's rooms or they'd come to mine and um, we'd then have our own rehab in a sense. Like I remember um, there was one... I became uh, neutropenic and I was on a home visit and had to come back in because they were concerned about um, if I'd catch, catch anything or uh, they wanted to monitor me. And I remember being absolutely devastated, but because I'd made this, mm. these friends in the rehab unit, they all came to my room or um, with their PPE on. And I remember we were like uh, drawing on the, um, little sick bowls and putting them as like cowboy hats and um we were like throwing things to each other so we were actually doing like quite physical and um cognitively uh, stimulating things together even though it was like half past seven eight p.m at night we were we were doing in a sense our own rehab um which was really really nice and like those are definitely the happier memories that I have um, is being able to form those relationships no that's really and you know you've just gotten us thinking there about a part two potential for this because I do keep in touch with a couple of my like long-term Gill and Barry patients so I keep, keep in touch with them it, some people might find this a bit weird but I absolutely adore them mm. um, and I think of two young people in particular um who I think would be great to do a little podcast together with you and with them um they do have long lasting um impairment but yeah it would be it would be great to do that so I'm thinking about that I think that's really important and I don't think as therapists will understand the power of that patient connection patients amongst patients um so thank you for highlighting that now the final bit I want to get you to talk about is being a physio so mm -hmm. You went to university, you've qualified, you're newly qualified, you're in a professional role. Is it all it cracked up to be? 
I... Is it worth it? <laughs> <laughs> Don't get me wrong, there are days where I'm like, what the hell am I doing? <laughs> but yeah, I absolutely love it. I think that being a physio is the best job in the world and for me having GBS was absolutely the best worst thing to ever happen and I I feel like this is genuinely what I'm supposed to do this is the where ha, my, the career I'm supposed to have um I love working with my patients I love forming those relationships I love speaking with people I mean sometimes they don't like me being there but I'm okay with that like I know I know how it feels to be in their position and like I I just think I just think that it's so cool I fe- I feel like we're almost like magical you see the immense changes the thing is is we're not like and I, I know we're not and like I've done I've maybe done a little magic. bit maybe a little bit we do have a little <laughs> bit of magic um but like I just it's I just think it's the coolest thing getting people um functional again getting people back to how they were before they were poorly giving people their life back like doctors and well doctors can save lives nurses sustain lives and I feel like physios and AHPs we give people their life back Mm -hmm. and I just think that is because it's all well and good saving a life but what if you can't do anything what if you can't get back to all the cool things that you used to do what if you can't get back to doing whatever and I just think that's why being working in rehab being a physio uh, speech and language therapist occupational therapist um it's just Mm. so cool (laughs) (laughs) well we're very grateful that we have you in our profession that is for sure now this might this is maybe a bit of a difficult question for you to ask newly qualified but you know from your perspective what can we do better as physios like you know I've I've said a few things from my perspective that I think would would don't focus on enough but what top tips have you've got for people to be better I think that I think that sometimes um physios especially can be quite results driven in the sense that you know we want to get people doing x y and z we want them to get out of bed into the chair and then we want them to get walking and we don't we look at the what we want from the person rather than the person in as a whole and I feel like sometimes we miss out on the therapist part of being a physio Mm -hmm. Um, and I do feel like I mean the experience I had my physios weren't like that but I've certainly seen it whilst I've been on placement um, and I've been guilty of it myself if I've had a really really busy day Um, but the, the patients that we're looking after they don't want to be in hospital they they don't really want to be in the position that they're in and I feel like oftentimes just sitting down having a chat with them that can give them so much more than trying to get them out of bed and into the chair um and so that's what I feel like we could be better in terms of the profession perhaps looking at I mean we're amazing in terms of being holistic like I know so many so many therapists are so brilliant but from my experience I would say that's the one thing that I've found can be lacking with certain therapists is is that part and it's almost like we leave it to um oh I'll just refer them to psych or I'll just refer them to somewhere else where actually we're walking them up and down the corridor form that relationship it doesn't have to be you know one one hundred percent focusing on their gait pattern or something like that um having having a genuine human interaction especially during covid when um people can't have their family can can do so much more for a patient than getting them to do 100 meters no i think that's such a valid point you know i think that part of it is circumstantial that the results and outcomes drive, uh, you know, drive is there. Part of it's time and resource, but there's an, we are autonomous practitioners. So at the end of the day, how we choose as an autonomous practitioner to spend our time and have developed that therapeutic contact is up to us. So, you know, maybe it is time to sit back and reflect and say, actually, are you being the most productive you can be in that time you have with that patient? And how would you define the productivity? How do you affect um, measure the success? Is it by 
an outcome measure or actually is it by what the patient tells you um I think that's that's a really important point and a great insight for someone who's newly qualified but again you're bringing all of this experience with you and that's one of the reasons why I was so chuffed you agreed to do this because the insights that you can give us as a profession is huge so thank you so much for taking thank the you. time now I'm sat here and we're definitely going to do part two so this isn't the end everyone we're mm-hmm. going to do part two with Rachel and hopefully two of my um wonderful patients who are now friends um who have been through this a very similar a similar experience so yeah watch this space well thank you so much for your time Rachel really appreciate it no worries